Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan, and this is... Krampus. Krampus. <laughs> uh, since we had extra announcements last week, uh, just going to do a quick merch announcement, and then we're off into the stories. And Lindsay's Krampus there is uh, one of the cards we have in the store. We have... Oh, cryptid tree. Oh, <laughs> another one. cryptid tree. We have uh, 16 premium, very like thick stock. Well, four designs broken into... S- you right. get four yep. of each. Yep. Yep. Four designs. Total of uh, 16 cards. And they are awesome. They're so cool. And so it's just cool to have them in the store now. Yeah. And they're like very pretty on the back, like old fashioned postcard. Mm-hmm. Very fun. Instead of your traditional, like, let me send you pictures of my family and what we did this year, a Christmas card, you could send spoopy postcards. Spoopy postcards. And we have uh, ornaments that are spooky. Oh, yeah. Um, Not typical Happy Elves uh, ornaments. Uh, take Take a look at the dark, grim reality of being overworked for hundreds of years by a controlling and menacing boss. (laughs) Each elf smiling, uh, if you count the stitches. Perhaps North Pole isn't as holly jolly as we might think. Um, So, yeah, we have these evil or angry elves, scary looking elves ornaments, and then also an evil Kringle tea available as well. It's no Will Ferrell elf. No. Don't, don't be confused. No, they're awesome. Love the continual designs. Head on over to badmagicmerch.com to check all this out. And be sure to order by December 7th if you want to ensure that your stuff uh, gets to where it's supposed to be going in time for the holidays. That is correct. And that's it. That's it. Story time. Yeah. How many stories are you uh, telling us today? Or what stories, I should say? Well, I'm telling two, which I know yeah. is shocking and amazing. Mm-hmm. But I do have two great stories this week. I have a possibly haunted apartment in Memphis. Okay. I don't think we've been to Memphis for this show. Maybe it was Memphis. Logan probably knows that song. You probably don't. <laughs> I don't. I'm, well, I just can't. I'm walking on me. I'm That's what I was thinking. <laughs> but walking it, with my feet on the I don't know how to Oh, it's like some old 90s country song. Maybe it was Memphis. Logan, I really thought it's like Jody Messina adjacent. Well, we can talk about it later. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I have that, but like, also like, is it haunted or mm-hmm. did the residents make it haunted? Okay. Did they bring it on themselves? And then a, another, we, we did not that long ago, a haunted house, but like a babysitter experiencing a haunted house. Yeah. I've got another one that is potentially more terrifying. Great. I'm into it. Yeah. Uh, I have another bigger story followed by a smaller one this week. Okay. The first story, the San Pe- Pedro haunting. It is San Pedro down there in, uh, by the LA, right? San Pedro? As opposed to what, Pedro? Right, exactly. Yeah, San Pedro. Yeah, San Pedro. Yeah, I was like, I haven't been there in forever. Okay. Uh, the San Pedro haunting, very intense, very active entity, terrorizing a young mother, her two kids, and anyone else who shows up to help them. Okay. And I can't believe I hadn't heard of this story before. The next story is about the, because it happened a while ago too, but the next story is about the mysterious disappearance of a massive ship during World War One, the USS Cyclops. Where did it go? Uh, where did some ships related to it go? Uh, We head to the Bermuda Triangle to examine this mystery. Well, that's where it went. Mm -hmm. You go there, you don't come back. (laughs) Are you ready to get started? There's not much setup on this first one as you showcase your spooky socks. Oh my gosh, I love these socks so much. They might be my new favorites. Look how cute they are. They are little voodoo dolls. Oh, nice. Yeah. They're like, oh, there we go. Look at that. Thank you. Look, like on the back, they're so cute. And then they say, (laughs) do you love me? They're so cute. So thank you to Brenda Fieri for these awesome socks. And also I have this like fan made blanket that I've had now for a couple years. uh, And I just rotate to my blankets. And I was like, oh yeah, I love this one. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Enough, enough pleasantries. Enough niceness. Now we get into the terror. Terrify me. I dare you. (laughs) Okay. I'll try. November of 1988. Jackie Hernandez had recently separated from her husband, Al, and moved into a small bungalow in San Pedro, California. Jackie was a sweet-natured 26-year-old woman starting her life over out on her own with her young son, Jamie, while pregnant with her daughter, Samantha. The little house she moved into wasn't much, but Jackie didn't care. She was excited for a fresh start with her kids. 
her excitement would not last long. Time now for the tale of a haunting in San Pedro. Within days of moving in, she noticed something didn't quite feel right about her new home. Jackie often had the feeling that she was being watched or worse, that she was being followed around the house by something. She never felt truly alone in her new place. Always felt like there was something else, someone else there with her, someone she soon strongly began to, to suspect was a spirit of a man. Jackie later said in an interview with paranormal investigator Barry Conrad, I'd be cleaning or doing regular household chores when all of a sudden I'd feel that someone was standing behind me. But when I turned around, he'd always be gone. I still wasn't sure that my house was haunted, though. That didn't happen until later. Initially, Jackie convinced herself that her feelings were nothing more than the imagination heightened and made paranoid due to the stress and anxiety that came with being a young mother living in a new home with no other adults around to help protect her and her kids. But then she began to witness objects start to move around on their own. The first incident happened when she walked by her desk where her estranged husband, Al, who'd come over to visit the kids, was sitting. A pencil holder suddenly came flying at her and the pencils fell all over the floor. She knew that Al had nothing to do with it. He was fully in her line of sight the entire time when it happened. Both she and Al were dumbfounded. Unable to rationalize it, Jackie tried to ignore it instead, act like it never happened. But then shortly after this incident, Jackie's friend Darlene was sitting at the kitchen table with her son Jamie when a painting of a goose that had been hanging in another part of the house flew through the room and landed on the kitchen counter. When Darlene cautiously went to put the picture back where it belonged, she found the two nails that had been holding it up impossibly balancing themselves vertically on the mantel under the spot where the painting originally hung. Jackie's friend would bear witness to numerous bizarre and often frightening events. Darlene would later talk about another paranormal encounter she had inside the house, a much scarier one, in a 1997 documentary about all this titled An Unknown Encounter, a true account of the San Pedro haunting. She said that one day while watching the children for Jackie, who was out of town, she heard a menacing voice in the bedroom say, don't come in here. Darlene was immediately terrified, convinced that the spirit would become, become violent and attack her if she didn't listen. Meanwhile, no one was experiencing more troubling occurrences inside the home than Jackie. A couple of nights after the painting incident, Jackie had finally gotten Jamie to fall asleep and was headed to bed herself when she walked past a light switch in the hallway and froze. She said for at least five seconds, she watched a stream of water flow out from the light switch and then abruptly completely stop. Putting it down to how tired she was or some trick of her imagination, Jackie walked to her bedroom and did her best to forget about it but it was getting harder and harder to ignore the strange occurrences that kept happening. A month or so later, just after baby Samantha was born, Jackie got a kitten for Jamie to help him adjust to all the recent changes in his life. A lovely little calico named Cleo. Cleo started out as a very mellow little kitten, but soon she started hissing and growling at seemingly random spots on the walls and chasing strange shadows around the house. Cleo seemed to brighten little Jamie's mood, but she quickly added to Jackie's stress. The following month, in March of 1989, things escalated a little further. Jackie and her friend Susan Castaneda were in the house having coffee when out of nowhere a lamp that sat out of both women's reach flew across the room, smashed on the ground right in front of them both. Susan screamed. Seeing this, on top of hearing what Jackie was about to tell her regarding what she'd already experienced, would leave her frightened and very concerned for her friend and for Jackie's children. After the lamp episode, Jackie confided, confided in Susan about something much more terrifying than we've gone over so far, an apparition she called the old man. Jackie told Susan that recently she'd been seeing the apparition of an old man sitting in various spots around the house, usually on a bed or a kitchen chair. The old man never seemed happy. He always gave off a very malevolent energy. Jackie was convinced the old man wanted her out of the house. She thought about moving, but she had a young family and no extra money. Where was she going to go? Jackie said she first saw the old man a few weeks earlier. One night, when Jackie was sitting in the living room, shortly after putting her kids to bed, watching an episode of The Honeymooners, enjoying the escapism of some mindless, nostalgic comedy, she heard a noise come from the other side of the house. Instinctively thinking it must be the baby, she headed off towards the kid's room, and right as she began to quietly enter the room, she had to stifle a scream that would have awoken her children. There on the lower bunk bed, beneath her son Jamie, sat the old man. 
Wearing a red flannel work shirt and high water pants, the apparition with the grayish complexion of, the, of a corpse glared at her with angry, sunken eyes. And then a moment later, right as she was about to push past her fear and run towards the entity to grab her son and baby, Samantha, and run, the old man vanished. After he disappeared, Jackie stood in the doorway quietly for what felt like an hour, waiting to see if he was going to come back. The thought of him doing something to her children made her sick. But she couldn't think of a single example of a ghost actually hurting anyone. Didn't they usually just go away? She told herself that they did. And so she was able to fall asleep that night with the hope that the old man wouldn't return. But of course he did. Jackie started seeing the old man more and more often. She always seemed to wait until no one else would see him for her to be alone. And then he'd appear, always somewhere in the house, always sitting, glaring at her with his intimidating eyes. Adding to the terror he instilled in Jackie, each time he appeared, he stayed longer than the time before. One night, she claimed that he stayed and glared all the way until the sun came up, just sitting and staring ahead from a chair in the living room. Jackie would eventually learn that the old man was one of two spirits in the house, one being benign and the other, the old man, vengeful. The benign spirit would one day lead Jackie to his grave about 13 blocks from the house. Jackie later told the LA Times that the other spirit, the old man, took my fear and got energy from it. The more scared I got, the stronger it got. Jackie wasn't just experiencing terrifying encounters in her waking moments now. She was also being haunted in her dreams. Jackie had a violent nightmare where she was a younger man being clubbed with a pipe and then drowned in the San Pedro Harbor. The people in the dream looked like they might be from the 1930s. It felt so real. It felt like Jackie was being held underwater, like she was dying. There was so much going on in this house. Moving objects, the old man, nightmares, a disembodied voice, the feeling of being watched and followed, and more. One afternoon, Jackie heard a disturbing series of sounds coming from the attic. It started off as a rattling sound, and then morphed into the sound of footsteps. Scared, but also searching for answers, Jackie went into the laundry room, climbed on top of the washing machine to access the attic through a little hatch. She lifted the hatch and popped her head inside slowly, not wanting to fully climb in until she'd taken a good look around. The air was thick with dust and her eyes were struggling to adjust to the darkness. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw a light. Slowly turning her head to face in the direction it came from, she let out a piercing scream as she saw a floating, disembodied head making a beeline for her face. She ducked out of the attic, closed the hatch as fast as she could, nearly falling and breaking her neck before running to call her friend Susan in a total panic. Susan came over to the house almost immediately and listened as Jackie told her about the floating head. Susan made her friend a cup of coffee, sat her down and began to do the dishes, wanting to help as much as she could, but just a minute into her task, it was now Susan's turn to scream and nearly fall down as she jumped back, startled from the sink. Coming from the cabinet, she watched a stream of thick orange ooze. After a few moments, the ooze no longer flowing from the cabinets, Susan and Jackie looked for the source of the mysterious liquid, and it seemed to come from nowhere. Susan decided then and there that she had to get help for her friend. Jackie was overworked and exhausted as a single working mother. She didn't have the time or energy or money to get herself out of this predicament, but she had a great and caring friend in Susan. Susan, grabbing a sandwich bag to keep a sample of the ooze in, told Jackie, I'm going to find an investigator. This has to stop. Susan stayed, stayed true to her word and in the early summer of 1989, got a hold of Dr. Barry Taff, a parapsychologist with a very good reputation. After filling him in on all the details, he assured her he knew just the right people to look into their haunting. Dr. Taff called his good friend Barry Conrad, who worked in the film industry by day, but was the best paranormal investigator he knew by night. Barry always worked with his friend Jeff Wheatcraft, a photographer, and the pair would do what they could to gather evidence of the haunting and try to get to the root of the cases they investigated. Barry and Jeff agreed to examine the San Pedro haunting, and it would become the most intense paranormal investigation of their lives. On the evening of August 8, 1989, the two Barrys, Dr. Taff and Conrad, and Jeff Wheatcraft all arrived at the Hernandez residence. Jackie had two friends present when the men showed up, Susan Castaneda, her friend, who made the original call to Dr. Taff, and Christina Zivkovic, Jackie's babysitter. Jackie's estranged husband, Al, was also inside the house, but stayed in the bedroom with the kids while everyone else talked. Conrad and Taff started interviewing the women while Jeff walked around and took some pictures. They didn't have to wait long at all before becoming convinced that this haunting was all too real. During this initial interview, they heard what sounded like a 200-pound rat running around the attic. The interviews were then completely interrupted by a loud crashing sound accompanied by a scream from Jeff. 
Rushing into the laundry room and headed towards the source of the noise, everyone present saw a very disoriented looking Jeff on top of the washing machine. It took my camera, he shouted, his voice full of disbelief. Something took my camera and pushed me out of the attic. Barry Conrad now accompanied Jeff into the attic to search for the camera, which they found in a wooden fruit box on the far side of the room, nowhere near where Jeff had been. On their way back down, Jeff screamed out in pain when something hit him in the back. When they got downstairs and into the light, Jeff lifted up his shirt, and everyone present saw a large red handprint in the middle of his back. Jackie was mortified. This was where she lived, where she slept, where her children lived and slept. Her worst fear regarding all of this had just been proven possible, that something in the house could hurt her children. But still, where was she going to go? The two berries and Jeff still weren't certain what was in the house or why it was there. They only knew that whatever it was, it didn't like Jeff. During that same first evening, the team also witnessed several light anomalies. Barry Conrad took a camera into the attic to investigate, now leaving Jeff behind and his camera inexplicably wouldn't work in that space. As soon as he would leave, it would return and function like normal. The same evening, Barry saw three flashes of light followed by a black mass moving through the attic. Odd lights would become a common theme throughout their investigation. Often, when the team went back through their footage, they saw streaks of light floating into and around people. Before the team left, Susan handed over the sandwich bag of orange goo to Barry Conrad, who planned to take it to a friend for analysis. And then the evening came to an abrupt end when Jackie's husband, Al Hernandez, emerged from the kid's bedroom, terrified, claiming to have heard a booming voice clearly saying to him, Tell them to get the fuck out! That night, the three investigators found a nearby motel to stay the night in, and something from the house followed them there. (gasps) Jeff entered his room after taking a shower and screamed when he was confronted by the apparition of a sickly-looking, angry old man sitting cross-legged on the foot of the bed the same spirit Jackie first saw on the bottom bunk. The orange ooze was tested, and the results, not good. It was determined to be male human blood plasma. The cabinets had been bleeding. In the coming weeks, there were a lot of terrified calls from Jackie as the activity in her home picked up from its already previously horrific levels. Barry Conrad visited her at his next opportunity, taking his friend Brian as a witness this time. While Barry and Jackie were talking, Brian accompanied Jamie into the kitchen. Jamie wanted ice cream, but was too small to reach the freezer. As he was opening the freezer for the little boy, Brian heard heavy breathing coming from the laundry room. He handed Jamie his ice cream, sent him back to the living room. Then he went to peek around to the entrance of the laundry room to investigate, and he found nothing. But then when he re-entered the kitchen, he saw that two alphabet fridge magnets had fallen to the floor. The letter G, and just to the right of it, the letter O. Go. Barry Conrad had been continually discussing this troubling extreme case with every expert he knew in the paranormal field. No one seemed to know how to help Jackie. Everyone everyone seemed to agree that it appeared that the haunting was caused by one or more angry spirits, as opposed to demons or other similar dark non-human entities. If there had been a demonic entity, then an exorcism might take care of the problem. But Conrad felt that an intelligent haunting from a spirit who was once human was much trickier. He believed the spirit had to choose to leave. For whatever reason, he wasn't part of the sage, salt, cleanse, and bless your home camp. All Barry felt he could do was continue to visit Jackie to offer support and document whatever paranormal activity he could. Late that summer, just for a week or two, it seemed like the problem might have taken care of itself. The activity in the home inexplicably stopped. Everything came to a standstill until the middle of the night on September 1st. It was as if the home's angriest entity, the old man, had been building up its strength. Barry Conrad received a call from the obviously terrified Jackie. He tried to kill me tonight, Jackie cried into the phone. I fell asleep on the sofa, and when I woke up, something was trying to suffocate me. It was impossible for Barry to travel to San Pedro that night, so he had a friend call Jackie to offer her some help. The friend did instruct Jackie to sprinkle salt around all the windows and doors of the house. This might not have worked very well, because Barry received another frantic call on September 4th. Jackie told him that now the doors were repeatedly slamming shut on their own in her house, that there were loud moans coming from the attic, toys and household items were levitating all over the place. That night, Barry and Jeff dropped everything else going on in their lives, rushed to the house to investigate. When Barry and Jeff arrived, the activity seemed to have settled down, but not stopped. There were still noises coming from the attic. Armed with his camera, Jeff, hoping for a better outcome than his last foray into the attic, went in to take a look. Jackie, Susan, and Barry anxiously awaited his return in the laundry room. After five minutes, they heard a great disturbance. They soon learned that they were hearing something trying to strangle Jeff. 
Uh, his face red, missing his glasses, Jeff appeared to be struggling with something around his neck as he crawled back to the attic's entrance. Barry reached up to try to help him, and he pulled loose what looked like to be a, a piece of cord. He watched as an invisible force then pulled Jeff up onto a nail protruding from a rafter beam and attempted to hang him from it. The clothesline cord wrapped around his neck, hung over the nail, being pulled tighter and tighter. Interestingly, Barry had searched the attic a few days before and only found seashells and a horseshoe, never a cord. After getting the cord off of Jeff's neck and getting Jeff back down into the kitchen, Barry went back up to retrieve Jeff's glasses from the attic, found them laying in the exact same wooden crate where Jeff's camera had once been. After Jeff's experience, he developed a terrible headache. And while Barry was recording in the attic after getting Jeff out, he saw a white light in the viewfinder and felt electricity go through his body the moment he saw it. He said he actually blacked out for a moment. All of this sent Jackie and Susan into a panic, and they ended up shouting for everyone to leave the house. They didn't want to further enrage whatever was in the attic. Susan told Jackie that she was going to stay with her for the night, and Jackie ran to gather up her kids. When everyone got outside, they noticed what looked like a spot of blood now on baby Samantha's forehead. After a moment of panic, they realized that Samantha wasn't bleeding. There was no injury that could be the source of the blood. In fact, Samantha seemed perfectly calm and content in that moment. Jackie wiped the spot of blood off her forehead. Later, she'd wished she'd gotten a sample to test it in the lab. Whose blood was it? Why had it been placed on her baby's forehead? Part of some ritual? Had she been marked for some terrible reason? Barry didn't want Jackie to have to ever go back to that house. He was now worried about her safety and the safety of her kids. And he offered her a temporary place to stay in the city. It was a small studio apartment, no one was using it, and it had zero angry ghosts in it. And now shit gets weirder still in this crazy story. As they were leaving the property, an elderly woman came walking towards Jackie, showed up out of nowhere, introduced herself as Yolanda, claimed to live down the street. She said she was a medium, and that one of the spirits inside Jackie's home had just made contact with her. She claimed this spirit was of one of many spirits living in the home. She said the spirit who contacted her was the spirit of a Native American who was experiencing great unrest due to one of the other spirits, an old man who had died by hanging rather recently. The old man was full of anguish and anger and did not want the investigators interfering with his business. What business that was exactly, she didn't know. She didn't know if the spirit of the old man even knew. He was just so full of rage and confusion. Everyone was in complete shock. Yolanda was a stranger. How could she know these details? unless she truly was a medium and had been contacted by a spirit from Jackie's home. They all decided the best thing to do would be to meet up at the house again and attempt to make contact with these spirits, with this woman's help. On September 24th, 1989, Barry, Jeff, Susan, Yolanda, and Jackie gathered around a Ouija board to ask questions. They asked the spirit what it would prefer to be called. The planchette moved to the letters S, M, E. Jackie asked if there was more than one entity the planchette moved quickly to the number five. Jackie asked the entity if it was trapped between worlds and if it was sad. Again, it's spelled S-M-E. Jackie asked, are you here because of an artifact in my possession? S-M-E. Oh Jackie asked it to spell its first name. Again, the planchette moved to S-M-E. When Jackie asked how old it was, the entity said it was 5,040 years old. What did that mean? None of them knew. The only, they only knew that this Ouija board session was not leading them to a place where Jackie and her kids would be safe in the home. Jackie took Barry up on his studio apartment offer. After a few weeks of staying in Barry's apartment, Jackie and her husband Al decided to try and reconcile. The family now moved into a trailer in the little town of Weldon, California, east of Bakersfield, in late October of 1989. At first in Weldon, Jackie felt better and thought that the ghost that tormented her had stayed back in San Pedro. A couple of months went by peacefully, but in the spring of 1990, a new haunting started up again. In late March of 1990, Jackie's daughter's bedspread caught on fire immediately after Jackie and a friend saw a black mist floating down the hallway. Jackie's new neighbors also began to experience strange things. One neighbor reported hearing a series of three knocks coming from various places inside her home. Jackie and two neighbors, while moving a TV into a storage shed, all three of them saw the face of the old man sitting inside the TV the old man from San Pedro. Jackie screamed and they nearly dropped the TV. Then that night, Jackie heard someone pounding on the inside of the shed, wanting to get out. On another night, something even more horrifying occurred. Al was suddenly pushed back by something no one could see while talking to Jackie, and Jackie saw a plume of black smoke then enter the back of his head. Before Jackie could register what was even happening, Al slapped her hard across the face, pushed her down onto the floor, and started pulling at her hair. Jackie struggled and cried and eventually got off of him by biting his arm. Al rolled to one side, a plume of smoke now rising out of his head. 
Barry Conrad later wrote in the book about all this he'd base his documentary on, An Unknown Encounter, a true account of the San Pedro haunting. As for the scary experience with her husband, she knew that she'd witnessed something so incredible that it was hard for her to believe it was real. But the sting from the slap told her this is very real. Al had apparently been possessed by something unearthly. Something strange was happening here. And she knew now she'd underestimated the power of the wraith that had terrorized her in San Pedro. When Al recovered, he stood up and said out loud, Show yourself to me, damn it! You pick up my wife? Why not just show yourself, here and now? I want to sign, you bastard! The next day, Jackie walked into the bedroom and saw Al written on her wall in a red substance. The babysitter had also mentioned hearing strange noises during the night. It seemed the ghost of the old man was gathering strength in Weldon. In almost no time at all, the same paranormal incidents that had tormented Jackie and San Pedro were back in full force. The sofa levitated, the sound of dogs howling surrounded the trailer when there were no dogs nearby, and an apparition floated towards Jackie, often when she was in the shower. Jackie was back on the phone with Barry asking for help. She was more upset than ever. She'd moved and it had followed her. What else could she do now? Barry and Jeff set out to visit Jackie and Weldon. They were going to attempt to communicate with the spirits again at a, t a loss for what they could do to help, apart from find out who the spirits were, what they wanted. When they arrived at the trailer, there was a clear full moon in the sky, and Jeff instantly spotted a shadow moving from the trailer to a storage shed nearby. Chills ran down his spine. Were they sure none of this was demonic? Jackie was with her friend Tina, who lived nearby. The four of them now gathered around a small table in the sitting room with candles lit and a Ouija board in the center. The first question Barry asked was, are you able to communicate verbally? The immediate, they immediately made contact and the planchette moved to N-O. When asked if there was more than one entity in the room, they received a reply, four. Jeff asked, where are you from? H-E-L-L. -E <laughs> H -E -L -L. The table began to vibrate. Jackie asked, are you the devil? N-O. Do you follow the devil? N-O. Are you evil? Y E Y S. Have you ever killed someone? N O T Y E T. The room now grew cold and thick with tension. They continued asking questions, eventually getting the entity to admit that it was once human. Boom, boom, boom! A loud pounding came from under the table, and Jeff flipped forward in his seat, seeming to have lost consciousness. The planchette continued moving without any questions being asked. I must grieve always. Jeff, now looking around bleary eyed, gave the group the nod to carry on. The entity said it was born in 1912, the planchette continuing to move on its own, that it was trapped. When Jackie asked if it could move on to a higher dimension, the spirit repeated, I must grieve always. The spirit said it died in San Pedro Bay. How did you die? I was held underwater. When asked if it drowned, the spirit said, No, I was held underwater. M U R D E R. The spirit said he died in 1930. When Jackie asked what they could do, he said, Help me, I continue to rot. Barry asked the entity why he didn't like Jeff. The entity answered, He has the likeness of my killer. The entity said it was murdered by a man who looked like Jeff, who once lived in the San Pedro house. The entity claimed it must get revenge on his killer, since it was being forced to relive its death over and over and over. When asked if the entity hated anyone, it spelled out J-E-F-F. -F. Jeff was now suddenly lifted upwards in his chair, thrown against the wall, hard enough to shake the trailer. Jeff went unconscious. Everyone thought he was dead for a moment. He didn't move, but thankfully he was still breathing and regained consciousness quickly. After taking a pause and weighing the risk, he decided to continue with the Ouija board session. Jeff felt he, they were so close to being able to help Jackie get rid of her torment. Jackie asked the entity if it would ever leave her alone, and the reply was 1-3-M-O-N-T-H-S, 13 months. And that was it. The spirit was done talking. In the weeks following that night, Barry found old newspaper articles about the man's death, and it seemed legit. A body was found washed up in the bay. His death was ruled a suicide, but according to the entity, it wasn't. Someone had deliberately held a man underwater and drowned him. He thought the spirit was once Herman Hendrickson, a seaman who was found floating under a pier on March 25, 1930. Hendrickson was actually in his late 20s, rather than 18 years old, as he said during the Ouija board session. The coroner ruled his death a drowning, but the police determined that the jagged wound on his head came from falling off the dock. Jackie and her friends did their own research and came to believe that the spirit of the old man was John Damon, a man who built the bungalow in San Pedro. Miraculously, the spirit, whoever the spirit was in real life, remained true to his word. At the one-year mark, or as the one-year mark approached since the beginning of the haunting, spirit activity slowed down. And then at 13 months, it stopped. But before, in June of 1990, Jackie moved back to San Pedro, and almost immediately her haunting started up again. Jackie started to capture pictures of strange light anomalies in her apartment. 
One day, Jackie saw a ball of light outside her new house in San Pedro. She followed the hovering light to a nearby graveyard, and it hovered over the grave of John Damon. The light then circled around the grave until it disappeared. Jackie believes this was Damon saying goodbye to her, but the ghost wasn't quite done yet. Luckily, this time, Jackie wasn't the victim of its paranormal attacks. After returning home from work one night, Barry Conrad found pairs of scissors laying open on the pillow of his bed. A lump caught in his throat. He knew the ghost was stopping by to pay him a visit. Sure enough, the next week he was plagued with poltergeist activity. Frequent knockings, bangs, objects levitating around his condo, the back burner on his stove repeatedly turning on by itself. Barry and Jeff did everything they could to document and photograph the activity. But within the week, the entity was gone. And then, no one ever saw or heard from the San Pedro ghost again. Jackie and her husband Al split up once more. She moved again. She later told the LA Times in 1993, I'm more scared of dying than I was before. Of living in hell. In hindsight, I think I was fortunate to see and experience firsthand something that most people never see. As I referenced earlier, in 1997, Barry Conrad produced a documentary about all this, An Unknown Encounter, A True Account of the San Pedro Haunting. In 2009, he'd publish a book of the same title. According to the website Road Trippers, as of September 2008, Jackie's former bungalow is still being haunted. Neighbors registering eerie activities happening in and around the house. Crazy story, right? I got so excited for one minute. I thought they were gonna solve this murder. Yes, me too. I was having the um the uh, what was that story? The woman, the nurse. Oh ba, 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 ba. yes, I the nurse from the Philippines in Chicago. That lady. It's been too long I since I've, I've gone over it. I can't remember her name right now. No, I, I cannot remember either. But yeah, the nurse, the nurse in Chicago. Maritza, who, no. Anyways. Teresita Bassa. There you go. Maritza, I was close. I was yeah. so close. I'm glad I jogged your memory. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, I was I was so excited. I was like, yes, 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 yes. They're going to go. They're going to get scuba divers. They're going to go down there. They're going to go into I, the bay. Like, and they're going to. I know. It's always weird when this thing is like tormenting them because of. You know, in this case, supposedly some unsolved murder, but then the mur- but then they don't solve the murder and it still goes away. Well, I feel like it probably just moved on to somebody else. I feel like it does like waves the f- of thirteen months. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, if if yeah, if this, this story again is true, meant intense God. activity and trying to hang the guy in the attic. That was horrifying. Like I don't, I can't think of any. Well, I guess we've had ghosts like maybe like try to like set fires, mm, push people down the stairs. Yeah, but that I mean, hanging that is especially brutal. Hmm. Uh, a few pictures. Okay. This first one, the home in San Pedro where today's haunting began. It was just an innocuous looking house. Yeah, just a regular old house. Uh, this next These windows are creepy. <laughs> <laughs> this next one, a picture of a terrified Jackie Hernandez. Yeah, rightfully so. Oh, she looks so stressed. Mm, holding baby Samantha. Oh. Okay, at first I didn't see baby Samantha's head. I was like, why is she holding a tutu? <laughs> uh, next one is a picture of Jeff Wheatcraft crawling into the attic where the entity supposedly tried to strangle him. Dude, that guy's brave. Or, well, and, or and dumb. Actually, and actually, the photo didn't say if that was Jeff or Barry. It's either, it's Barry, it's like his photo from like the documentary and stuff like that. But they never, in the articles, is that Barry or is that Jeff? But I, one of them. B- regardless, Jeff is either brave or dumb. Going back into that Ouija board right. session after being slammed against a wall and losing all consciousness. Yeah. The heck? And then this uh, this next one, uh, this is a reenactment of how uh, Jeff was supposedly found in the attic. My God. Right, that cord being pulled over a beam and a nail there just kind of wrapping around his throat. It makes my stomach hurt. It genuinely makes me feel sick. Ugh. Yeah. Are there any more photos? Are we done? Nope. That's it for the photos. That story is awful. That's <laughs> yeah. really, really, really scary. It's a very scary. intense uh, haunting. Yeah, and like, I don't think that we usually cover stories where the they, they leave, they do GTFO, yeah. and then it follows them. Yep, that the old That's man showed up, showed up in the hotel room, showed up in the Weldon, California. Uh, and also, like, okay, if if his body was found, I mean, is he is the spirit of the old man just stuck because he doesn't feel like the truth about his death is out there? I don't even understand. Like, and they don't even know for sure if it's like it belongs to that entity. Like, because we well, kept selling out SME. I was not happy. I'm like, stop spelling that. Oh yeah, that's what like a terrible Japanese thing. Oh, SME was. Um, one of those Victorian stories I told you. Oh, Victorian. 
What's, yeah. There's one where it's like you're not. Oh, oh, no, no. It's with the Z. I don't want to say it. Okay. You're not allowed okay. to say it. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't say that because that just conjures. I'm, so in my mind, it was that. I was like, oh, no, oh, no. Please <laughs> stop. SME. Uh, that doesn't even mean anything. Yeah. Somebody's initials. Who knows? Hmm. I know there always is so many weird things in so many of these stories where it's not like it doesn't follow the logic we want it to. No, it sure doesn't. It's like just give the details, the, the needed details. I don't know. It has me flashing back to our story from last week with the the computer. Mm -hmm, true. I, because for the why it was making me think of that is like these Ouija board spell outs were very elaborate. I don't right. think that I have heard any other. I, I truly cannot think of any other story where the spell out on the Ouija board is so elaborate. Mm -hmm. 13 months, like uh, I was murdered. I mean, sentences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's unusual. Yeah, true. And then it made me think about those guys from last week weirdly communicating between dimensions. Yeah. I guess yeah. that's really all a Ouija board is. Like, you mm. know, just a it paranormal be, computer. What if it's like they can try and talk to, uh, you know, people, living people in our world, but it's like um, talking underwater or something or trying mm. to talk through water. We're just so muffled and like the connection or, or like a really bad tele, like, you know, cell connection. Yeah. Where it's just like distorted and like words chops are cut, in and chops out. in and out. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, I guess I didn't consider that, but sure, why Why not? I found it interesting in this story, there's no talk of having the house blessed. I know, I know. And I didn't like that. Well, for one second, no they had the salt. Rituals, right, the salt was, a, was a, uh, the quick thing the one time. Uh, no talk of at least just trying to have the house exercised, you know, uh, sage, nothing. Mm -hmm. I wonder, did Barry not want this entity to leave? Did he want it to terrorize the family further to make it better for his book or make it better for a possible documentary? He was in the entertainment business during the day. Yes. I did have that thought when you said that he was not of the school of thought. One of the Barrys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Did you just hear that? Uh-uh. Okay, it's fine. Everything's fine. I just <laughs> literally just heard a little voice in my ears go, stop. I heard like a little, so I, th I don't know if it was like a car outside hitting slush or something, but as soon as you said that, I definitely thought I heard something to my right too. That's <laughs> creepy. My God, that's so it, creepy. You thought it was something like, stop. Stop. That's creepy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. This story, you know what's what's weird to me about certain stories? I can question the credibility of like any of them. Yeah. But there's certain stories where I might think, I don't know, there's a lot of extra details in this one. There's this um, this conflict of interest with this guy's working in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. But kind of like the old times, like Annalise Michelle, mm -hmm. The Exorcism, there's some stories where it's like, as I'm working on them, I get the chills. Yeah. And as I'm talking about them, it's like this feeling of like, you're not supposed to be talking about this. I, I felt really uncomfortable during mm -hmm. that entire story. Yep, they make me uncomfortable where there's like, for whatever reason, it was making my palms itch. <laughs> I am scared of the entity of the old man, and I believe that entity to be real. I know, I know, I know. But is that just good storytelling? Could be, or I don't know. But I'm, I'm like, is that? It could be just good storytelling. I don't know. And, and my gut is also like, not a ghost. Oh boy, oh that's boy, not oh boy. something. It's uh, uh, something worse. I genuinely did not care though for the idea that. Uh, Barry, one of the Barrys. Mm -hmm. Barry Conrad, was the, the not, investigator. Yeah, he was like, oh, I just, you know, am admittedly not like the salts, sage. And, and that was an opinion guy. I gave of him. He didn't, that wasn't a quote from him. Oh. That was my uh, speculation about it because he's like, he he sure didn't seem to be. Well, no, because I mean, he only told her about salt once. Mm hmm And just that, and just that kind of thing of like, how do you make that judgment call of like, well, it's not a demonic entity. How do you know? Yeah. You know, it's like. like who, let's not who died get, and made let, you the expert? Yeah, let's not get a priest in here. Let's not get a pastor in here. Let's no. not get anybody to try and like a spiritualist, you know, like to try and a shaman type to try and like Anything. cleanse the home. Anything at all. It seemed like, I don't know. And again, I'm totally speculating. Yeah. But I'm like, did you not want to do that? Did you want to see? If you're somebody who's a paranormal investigator, let's say that they really did see these things. And now you've come across kind of a gold mine, basically. You're trying to document it. You do have aspirations of making a documentary or, you know, whatever, yeah. maybe having this launch you somewhere. And again, speculating. But if you have that, um, if that's your angle. Yeah. And then you see this thing where there's intense paranormal activity. Mm -hmm. Do you really want it to stop right away? Or do you want it to stretch it out and have it become some Amityville situation or some like most notorious horror, you know, kind yeah. of true horror situation ever because then your name is associated with it. There, There is motivation to not want to fix it. Well, yeah. There could it, be. And it wasn't affecting his life negatively yeah. in any way. It wasn't coming home He's with him. There. He didn't have to live in it. It wasn't anybody that he was emotionally attached to. That I, I've never Oof. really thought about that before this story about like you hire a paranormal investigator over Man. and they intentionally rile it up 
and, and actually don't have your best interest in mind at all and want to make it worse for you so they can document it and monetize it. Would you do that to me? <laughs> no, I would not. Are you sure? I'm sure. Because, I mean, sometimes you make me nervous. Yeah. Although you did recently say that, like, mm -mm, you're out on Ouija boards, which was like a <sighs> big yeah, sigh right, of relief. Right now, yeah, they freak me out. I like it. I like it. You do need another tattoo. I was thinking you could get, like, a little Ouija board tattoo. I don't know. I was trying to convince Dan to get, like, a little tarot card tattoo. I might get the, and the, he was like, I don't know. That makes me nervous. And it gave me such joy to have <laughs> to have you be, like, a little bit nervous about things that are maybe a little bit more... Um, a little witchy? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I am going to look... I'm going to look into a few tarot cards, and I'm like, okay, I got to figure out what it means. Talk to some people. And then... But I have the right space for it, just with what's left. A long, narrow piece. You have to talk to our friend Megan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She reads tarot. Uh, yeah, like, exactly. Like, and probably, has for a long time. Probably consult her. Yeah. Like, what do you think of the magician? Or what do you think no. of the hanged man? No. I don't know. Death card. There'll be something. Nah, it's pretty spooky. <laughs> not really. <laughs> Maybe that one. But I gotta I gotta understand it first. Yeah, it's just like, uh, it could be like the death, not like the death of a person, but uh, moving on, a new phase. Yeah, okay. I like that. Mm-hmm. Just saying. All right. That was a good one, huh? That was good. That didn't have the resolution. I'm really uncomfortable. Didn't have the resolution I wanted, but they often don't. Kind of no. like horror movies, you know? It's like, like rah. ah, well, you usually don't have a happy <sighs> ending or a nice clean ending. There were just so many moments where I was like, the lights, everything felt a little weird. Mm -hmm. Ooh. What was that in my ear? I'm so freaked out. Stop. That's so crazy. Stop. But it was like, it It didn't, when you speak, it sounds mm -hmm. a very specific way. It was like just in my right ear, Ugh, which weird. I know is not something that Logan can do from out there. So yeah. it's not that. It's not some like production trick. I don't know. You ready to move away from poltergeist activity and head towards a mysterious disappearance? Yeah, I don't like all the creepy dolls behind me right now. I'm so uncomfortable. A uh, bit of setup for the short story, but not too much. Okay. How could the biggest ship in the U.S. Navy vanish without a trace? Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> uh, we've covered missing crafts before on Scared to Death. Everything from ships to airplanes to cars. Maybe slightly easier to wrap our heads around the idea of a missing private airplane. After all, accidents happen, especially in remote places. Or a missing ship from the days before everything was rigorously tracked. But something about a Navy ship disappearing seems so unlikely. Navy ship, one of the most regimented places on Earth. Every crew member accounted for, every trip plotted and sent to higher-ups for confirmation and record-keeping. Seems impossible that one would just, poof, disappear. Poof. But in 1918, that's exactly what happened. In March of 1918, an enormous uh, collier, the USS Cyclops, disappeared on a voyage between the West Indies to Baltimore. And even now, a century later, we have few answers about where the ship may have ended up. Cyclops was no stranger to long journeys. She was nearly 550 feet long with a crew of typically around 300 and around 11,000 tons of manganese aboard when she sank. She'd been sailing successfully since 1910, traveling between the Baltic Sea, the, Carib uh, yeah, the Caribbean, and Mexico, assisting primarily with moving coal around the world and helping refugees. Time now for the tale of the mysterious vanishing of the USS Cyclops. In 1917, when America entered World War II, Cyclops became a key naval asset, transporting troops and everything else from coal to fuel to manganese ore to be used in munitions manufacturing. On February 22, 1918, she departed from Salvador, Brazil, for Baltimore, Maryland, with no stops, stops scheduled. But rather than proceeding directly to Baltimore, as scheduled, Cyclops deviated to Barbados, arriving there on March 3, 1918. At this port, she was about 1,800 nautical miles from her destination. Before leaving Barbados, Commander Worley, the commanding officer, did report that Cyclops' starboard engine was inoperative because it had, cr uh, it had a cracked cylinder reducing her speed to 10 knots. But the ship was also deemed safe to continue. The Cyclops departed Barbados for Baltimore on March 4th, and they would never be definitively seen again. There would only be rumors of sightings, like the one on March 9th off the coast of Virginia by the crew of the molasses tanker Amalco. But this sighting was denied by that ship's ca uh, captain. Investigations found that it was improbable that Cyclops was off Virginia on that date because she was not due at Baltimore until March 13th, and her speed of advance was reduced to about 240 nautical miles per day because of that unseaworthy engine. The weather off the Virginia Capes on the following day, March 10th, reportedly was violent. Did she just sink in a storm? Or did something else happen? She sank in the infamous Bermuda Triangle. Did she slip through a breach of some kind, of a breach of dimensional fabric, perhaps? 
The last known message from the ship said simply, weather fair, all well. But all wasn't well, because no one would ever hear from the ship ever again. In a feature published a couple years after the ship's disappearance, Santa Fe Magazine described the strangeness of this event. Usually a wooden bucket or a cork life preserver identified as belonging to a lost ship is picked up after a wreck, but not so with the Cyclops. She just disappeared as though some gigantic monster of the sea had grabbed her, men and all, and sent her into the depths of the ocean, and the suddenness of her destruction is amplified by the absence of any wireless calls for help being picked up by any ship along that route. At the time, people thought of a more earthly explanation, that maybe the Cyclops had been the target of a German submarine or raider, but if that was the case, why hadn't pieces of the ship or remains of its crew members ever surfaced? And after the war's end, why hadn't any record of a German hit on the Cyclops been recorded? Some thought, too, that the ship's captain, George W. Worley, was responsible. According to those who knew him, he was a drunk, unfit to captain a ship, and possibly got his crew in danger. Worley would berate and curse officers and men for minor offenses, sometimes getting violent. At one point, he allegedly chased an ensign around the ship with a loaded pistol. Slightly saner times found him making his rounds about the ship dressed in nothing but long underwear and a derby hat. There are rumors that his crew had mutinied against him. But if so, if any of that had happened, again, why wasn't any of the ship's wreckage ever recovered? Even more mysterious, and this may point to something supernatural, the Cyclops had three sister ships. All met similarly unfortunate ends. The USS Jupiter was converted to an aircraft carrier between 1920 and 1922, recommissioned as USS Langley. Langley was the first American aircraft carrier and vital in developing U.S. naval aviation capabilities. Stationed in the Philippines in December of 1941, she departed for Australia following the Japanese attacks on Pearl Harbor in the Philippines. But on February 27, 1942, while ferrying fighter planes to Southeast Asia, she was attacked by Japanese aircraft, hit by five bombs, causing critical damage. After her surviving crew members were rescued, Langley was scuttled by torpedoes fired by escorting destroyers. Okay, fine. Sunken in a normal kind of military way, but what about the other two sister ships? Very different for them. The USS Proteus sold on March 8, 1941 to become part of the Canadian Merchant Navy. And then just like the USS Cyclops, in fact, on the very same route, also lost at sea without a trace. Sometime after November 25, 1941. Similarly, the USS Nereus, last of Cyclops' sister ships, was in, a, in service as a shipping vessel for the Aluminum Company of Canada on February 27, 1941. She, too, lost without a trace after departing St. Thomas sometime after December 10th, 1941. Was it mere coincidence that these three ships, the Cyclops, the Proteus, Nereus, all disappeared in the infamous Bermuda Triangle? On June 1st, 1918, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin D. Roosevelt, declared Cyclops to be officially lost and all hands deceased. To this day, the disappearance of the USS Cyclops resulted in the single largest loss of life in the history of the U.S. Navy outside of combat. 292 souls. And we still don't know how these sailors met their fates. Was it simply a, so a storm, poor management? Or when they looked out on the horizon, did they see something strange, something watching them, something terrible, something waiting to abduct them? Were they drawn into some kind of vortex, trapped in some dimension parallel to ours? Are they still trapped there today? If time works differently in that space, do they still hope for rescue? That is so insane. The three ships under the same circumstances. Yep, just gone. What do you know about the Bermuda Triangle? I did cover it a long time ago on Time Suck, but it's honestly been so long, mm -hmm. I don't know, like five years ago, that I don't- Come on, pull it up in your encyclopedia brain. <laughs> that I don't remember all the details, but there is like, um, there was something about like these, there's all these random theories about like, basically how could a ship, because the, the big mystery with a, a ship like the Cyclops isn't that it could just, I mean, obviously any ship can just sink. Of course. But these ships are massive mm -hmm. and they don't sink in like one second. They don't, they mm -hmm. don't just quickly immediately. Yeah, that was just, a note I made where it's like you would see it go. No, it's slow. Down. It's slow. And they, and they have time for, um, to, you know, send a. Get off. <laughs> yep. Life rafts, you know, get some right. life rafts off. Send and, a SOS. Mm -hmm, exactly. They, they, they'll send out communication, some kind of, you know, um, blank on the right terminology, but like a telegram that can get some type of like SOS code sent out. Yeah. And would like the Titanic did, mm -hmm. you know, the Titanic didn't just whoosh, obviously. Uh, and then for all these ships, like in that area to disappear so suddenly, 
with no warning whatsoever and to have no trace of them ever be found. Never. That's no highly trace. unusual. That's what? If I remember correctly, the biggest theory is that there are these methane gas bubbles that can float up from the seafloor. And theoretically, but none of the, this has never been witnessed though. Theoretically, a if again, if I'm recalling from five years ago correctly, yeah. this giant methane gas bubble from some, you know, because uh, there's obviously natural gas under the earth, you know, Lots like that, toots, got <laughs> it. Uh, that can like, you know, uh, float up from time to time. And what it would do. I was having this vision of like some weird sea monster with like a giant butt just like. Whoop. If a school of fish all fart at the same time <laughs> while going under a giant ship. Yes. Immediate sinking. No, but, but what would happen is theoretically. This giant gas bubble, if it floated up underneath one of these ships, uh -huh. it would just, when it kind of hit the surface and popped, so to speak, it would leave a big vacuum that the ship would just fall into. Water would immediately crest over top of it and suck it down. But again- But this has never been proven to even be a thing. It's theoretically possible. But it's never been proven. No one's ever seen it. No one's, no ever, one's ever, no one's ever tested no, this in like a- uh, Maybe in a weird lab, like a little tiny boat test yeah, boat yeah, way, but yeah. that's so different than- uh, a giant freighter big enough to be an aircraft carrier. I know, I know. It's like a ship, a massive vessel of that size. And I'll show a picture. Actually, I, let me. This yeah. is a picture of this, this ship. It's an old picture, obviously. 19, but I mean, it's Holy a big, shit. big, big freighter. Yeah. Nothing. No. No. No test has ever been done on a on a you know ship anywhere near that size to show that this is possible. And then there's other things like uh, okay, just like you know, bad storms in the area. But the, but the storms. That that wouldn't that wouldn't allow for like no debris. But then there and then there are like what is that that flight? Uh, Malaysia Airlines was it oh, that disappeared yeah. in the South Pacific? Four seventy one or whatever. Right. We are, that we're going to do on time sick eventually. But like that disappeared without a trace. And like you know where did it go? I mean, there's a chance that something wouldn't wash up. I mean, you're way out there in the ocean. The ocean is so vast. But again, like to have multiple ships in this one region just completely vanish. Well, and that's not the only thing that's ever vanished. And planes, planes have vanished. The planes have inexplicably vanished there. There's been lots of shit in the Bermuda Triangle. And I do remember there are people who will posit rational possible reasons for all of this, but it is weird. It's weird. Honestly, it freaks me out so much that I'm like, I don't ever need to go there. <laughs> I, I don't want to go missing. Yeah, yeah. It, I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on down there, but it is Ichiwawa. Oh, totally. But Barbados, on the other hand... <laughs> I will I say love Barbados. I will so say beautiful. numbers numbers wise. I know. Yeah, ships still travel to the Bermuda Triangle all the time. Don't care. Every day, planes fly Don't over care. every single day. Don't care. <laughs> and the odds are still great you're gonna be fine. Just so you know, every time we get on an airplane, which is regularly because mm -hmm. of work, I always think like, okay, this could be the day. This oh. could be the day. I don't. I always I always find safety in stats. Nope. I just think like that's what everybody does. They think like, oh, not me. So I think like. <laughs> Today could well, be the day, so. You can't do anything about it. Sure can't. Yeah. So when we were flying home last night, mm -hmm. and it was, or yesterday morning, and <laughs> the plane, like, I mean, it has to, like, make this, like, sort of, like, turn. And I was like, oh, no, he's turning more than usual. Oh, God, we're going to go upside control. down. <laughs> Both the pilots had brain aneurysms, and the controls went down. Like, like all of a sudden, I think I'm on some Blue Angel flight where I think we're going to, like, flip upside down. Mm -hmm. It's insanity. My brain is insane. Now, when I was looking at Cyclops pictures, I wanted to find more. Oh, I figured there was going to be Cyclops. This next one is a very different kind of Cyclops situation. <laughs> what is this from? <laughs> this, is a sex, this is a sexy Cyclops gift. Hey. And I have no idea where it comes from, but it is hypnotic. <laughs> and then, uh, so that's, that's me. the little uh, gif I found. And then, of course, I knew you, know, okay. you do the, you, you pull up the image and then underneath it is always like related images. And you're like, where, where is this going to take me? Where can we go? This next thing is also called a Cyclops. It's is a- it an ice cream cone? No, it's definitely not. A, it's a piece of men's fetish <laughs> lingerie. <laughs> I hear Logan laughing. Pretty funny. It's that called is, the Cyclops. That is pretty funny. Because also, I mean, it's just a thong with a cutout. Mm -hmm, but like, it has a little, like, has a little ring in the front, you know. It's that BDSM kind of male male gear. Okay, but I mean, also like if women wore this, we just call this crotchless panties. True, true. But dudes we, get we, a little more, you know, cyclops. Well, one eyed true purple there's, people. Well, eater. there's also that. There's a yeah. lot of, and then I and then I that there was. But that, I, I was that, excited that you're going to show me the popsicle. Now that image led me to another image. 
Uh, and this is the superhero Cyclops. What? And he's all, he, there's a bunch of these like sexy Cyclops images. And you, the further you go down that wormhole, it leads to images like that's a tame one. And there's just a lot of, there is so much animated pornography. Like there is that, that guy, he's doing everything, every possible sexual thing you can do with a variety of like people, monsters, all kinds I'm of stuff. I'm not kink shaming at all. I oh, just no, don't it's like get an, it. Anime porn, but there's like, oh, tons and tons of these images. Like I was like, oh, okay. Actually, okay. We, we, I mean, we, good for them. We had the the guys come over. The 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 sniper guys come over and visit us. Yeah. And then I it was that sounds so funny. weird. We had the sniper guys. We have some fans <laughs> that are uh, some snipers. For snipers, ex military, and now they do like cool like sniper competitions, and they came to visit us at the and studio. Two of them are still military. Two of them are still active. Yeah, mm-hmm. active reserves. Yeah, and then uh, and then these. But I had <laughs> I had the much more graphic images all over my laptop. But luckily, this not. I mean, we would have joked oh about my it. God. But the screensaver. But I was I didn't notice it, and I was thinking like, oh, I'm glad the screensaver came as opposed to them just like noticing my laptop full of illustrated Anime porn. porn and like extreme the most extreme porn um I, well, now i'm curious now i feel like you're gonna have to show me just one image so i'll I can, show you after the yeah because i'm like how bad could it be it's a drawing oh did, i mean just a very yeah yeah you, you keep saying graphic anything. i understand yeah yeah, yeah. And, and then i wondered if, li- if uh <laughs> if liz <laughs> if no i was gonna say logan saw um me do because he was working on his own illustrations and i had my laptop as so i just keep looking at more and more pictures logan was like silently like, influenced like the next graphic t-shirt we have is like something about it's just not quite right mm-hmm. he's like i call this cyclops i call this cyclops <laughs> um <laughs> all right okay that's all i got okay bermuda triangle Man, it's so creepy. I, I just kept writing down, where is the ship? She's where like, is it? It, it? The thing about it that blows my mind is that there's just poof, nothing. Not Absolutely a, not nothing. A piece. Oh, God. What if you're, okay, what if you're like on that ship or that mm-hmm. plane that goes missing and you're still alive somewhere? I know there is. That a- is like, that sounds like <sighs> pure torture. No, and there's all these interesting theories. And again, like there's, it's been so long, but there's, ah, there's a story of, these guys who were, I can't remember, I think it was World War II, but I'm not positive. And they were flying somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. I want to say like over Greenland or some like up Arctic Circle somewhere, like way up there. Yeah. And, you know, in in contact with radio control. Mm-hmm. And, and they started saying the wildest shit right before they vanished forever. And it's a really weird story where they're just like, you know, they're, they see they this. Say? It was like a bright light, a ship of a ship of some kind. I want to say like they saw something they had a hard time describing. And they're like, what is it? What is it? And then there was like screaming and then just gone. Oh, my God. I don't ever need to hear that. Uh, that would. But yeah, what if they did just like go through like a fucking wormhole? My God, that would penetrate my soul and make me so upset <laughs> for so long. Ooh, we. Ooh wee, ooh wee. Um, uh, this is a question related but unrelated. What is manganese? What is manganese? Mag manganese. Mang manga like manganese. I think is how you say it. Mm-hmm. It's a. Uh, it is okay. Like lead. Like it's like a. It's a metal. I'll look it up to be like certain. magnum. No, it is a type of metal that is used in man- munitions manufacturing. But I just had no. I was like, is he trying to say like multiple mangoes? Mang- manganese. I didn't like, and then I was like, is he trying to say like magnesium? Manganese is a chemical element with the symbol MN, atomic number 25, hard, brittle, silvery metal, often found in minerals in combination with iron. It is a transition metal with a multifaceted array of industrial alloy uses, particularly in stainless steels. Huh. Okay. Okay. I can mm-hmm. picture that if you think about like a refrigerator. It improves strength, workability, and resistance to wear, which mm-hmm. would be great for munitions, where it's like something that's not going to like deteriorate. stainless steel refrigerator? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you for clarifying that. Yeah, you bet. I had no idea. Now, now I'm going to look up uh, why why munitions as you start to set up because now I'm curious. Well, I'm ready. You are you ready to go right now? Hey, this isn't time suck. We don't do wormholes here. We got uh, our answer. Oh. You you could go back to that later. Okay, all right, I'll go back to it later, sir. I'm thumbs back. down. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not allowed to be on my phone, you're not. I was going to share the info, but you're right. Let's get to the scares. Let's get to the scares. People, okay. are, we're not here for info. All right. All okay. Right. <laughs> you ready to go to Memphis? Walking in Memphis, walking with my feet down, we all bound. 
Walking in Memphis. Walking in Memphis. Do you really feel where I feel? I was doing Michael McDonald singing that for some reason. <laughs> I know. I couldn't figure out why. It's not who sings it. <laughs> okay, DJ, honey. <laughs> D, you just heard Michael McDonald's Walking in Memphis on <laughs> The Buzz. There's one fan that, uh, I don't know, I DJ, got a message. Honey, yeah. Fucking hates that. And it's just so funny, funny to me. I'm like, it's not going to stay forever. Yeah. It's just a funny little joke. It's just DJ Honey. Stop doing this. So DJ angry about it. Do, do you think wow. That, do you think that fan would enjoy the walking in my feet and Oh my gosh. I was, uh, <laughs> I poke around in our Facebook group every yeah. time, and there's like a huge debate about, um, oh, um, scenario. And they're like, they don't like the way we say scenario. They're like, it's scenario. And then these people are like going back and forth. About it. It's mm, so funny scenario, to me. Scenario, scenario, then route, route. Yep. And then fi- finally someone was like, you can get with the fucking Appalachia people. Appalachia, Appalachia. Uh-huh. And it's like colloquialism. It is like mm-hmm. astonishing to me. I have never, there is no word that I've ever heard that I'm like, you're saying that wrong, you idiot. And then get worked up about. Hmm. But man, I, I scenario, more, scenario. I get, scenario. I get more hung up on meaning than pronunciation. Totally. Where if somebody's like, and I literally jumped 10 feet up in the air. It's like, did you know? I'm like, that's Do it right incredible. now. Do it right now. Let me see. <laughs> you should be in a slam dunk contest. <laughs> you should call the NBA right now. No, but not literally. But like, I literally was scared out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good one. Oh, okay. So many haunted houses here on Scared to Death. A yeah. classic. You love a haunted house. I do. Story. You love a haunted house story. Not living in one, mm-hmm. not attending one. And they all, you know, sort of have that same like, too good to be true. The price was so reasonable. It was mm-hmm. a steal of a deal. I did reflect a little bit on it when I was putting the story together. I thought like, yeah, I was also once like young, broke, and in a very expensive city. When I lived in LA, I would have taken any deal anybody gave me. It would not have occurred to me until doing this show yeah. to think like, oh, is it haunted? Yeah. I would have been more like, is it in a bad neighborhood? Are the neighbors terrible? Are the landlords awful? awful? Or like, am I somehow kind of stealing from some old lady who's renting this place out and doesn't know what kind of gold mine she's sitting on? Like, I would have right, guilt. Right, right, right. But I mean, what if, like in LA, wouldn't you have taken any good deal you could have gotten? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And would you have thought like, oh, I wonder if it's haunted? Nope. Right, it's this show that does it to mm-hmm, us, right? Mm-hmm. Everything about it now. Yeah, I thought about that too. Real quick, this won't take long. Just before you dive in, one question for you. Am I do you really feel the way I feel? Yes, Michael, I do. Okay, all right. <laughs> this is my life, you guys. This is my life. This is how it is at home sometimes. It's fine. Right? Do you feel good I'm and good. ready to I focus? I thought of my system now. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't happy with the pitch I had there. <laughs> I want... <laughs> But I don't want to redo it because then I'll just eat up more time and I still won't be happy with it. Are, do you, are you going to no, be good. able to focus on the story? I will. I will. Okay. Okay. Are you sure? Yep. You are so sweetly challenged. I love <laughs> okay. you. Okay. Well, let's go see what's going on with Memphis and Elvis and all the things there. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Is it killing you? No, I'm good. <laughs> Hello, queen of the spoop and prophet of Nimrod, the master sucker of all things curious. <laughs> My name is Jared, and boy, do I have a demonic story for you. I used to be a massive skeptic, always looking for a logical explanation for all things that go bump in the night. But that all changed one night when I had just moved to Memphis from Yorktown. I was active duty in the U.S. Coast Guard for a little over four years, so I did move several times in that time frame. And I had just moved again to Memphis, Tennessee, after leaving training school in Yorktown, Virginia. I got orders to the Coast Guard sector Lower Mississippi River as a brand new non-commissioned officer. Since the base was tiny, I had to find a place to live, and what better place to look than in the heart of downtown Memphis, which was only a few minutes from the base. My girlfriend and I needed a place that was big enough for the both of us. I looked at several places before I fell in love with a charming little townhouse in a new complex. It had a very open floor plan downstairs, and the entire upstairs was the bedroom. It was perfect. I talked to my other half and sent her pictures as she was still living in Boston at the time, and she also loved it. I signed the lease and began moving us in. We both adored the place. It was very chic and the perfect size for the two of us. The price was pretty cheap for being in Memphis, so I guess you could call that a red flag. The complex was not new, I did find out later, but it was under new management and it had been newly renovated. It was in my budget and worth the short drive in a very busy city. 
There was also a story about the complex being where Elvis used to live, so that was pretty cool. We would hear these small noises here and there, but me being a skeptic, I chalked it up to squirrels on the roof since there were several trees around the apartment. I mean, it makes sense, right? We would hear the occasional scratches, knocks, or footsteps, but it was no big deal. The sounds, though, did become more apparent and more no noticeable, and the activity did increase to cold spots in odd places. The biggest, well, the biggest cold spot would occur in the kitchen, where there was no air vents nearby. It would be noticeably colder than the rest of the apartment, which I always kept at 75 degrees. One day, while my other half was hanging out with friends, I was in the kitchen in the middle of the morning making a pot of coffee when one of those cold spots appeared around me. I wanted to find a logical reason for it, but I found nothing that could make sense. I decided to attempt to contact whatever it was by asking open-ended questions. I asked if there was anybody there. Nothing. And the cold spot disappeared. I told my girlfriend about the experience, and then she opened up to me about an uneasy feeling she had any time she was in the apartment. A feeling of being watched. Fast forward to the end of the month. I want to say it was August, but this was over 10 years ago, so I don't remember exactly. But I do know that it was hot and humid outside, so we had stayed indoors in the AC. While we were sitting on the couch, we began to hear knocks on the wall behind us, and we were both overcome with full body chills. I looked over to her, and we both had that same flabbergasted look on our faces. We then heard a voice that was very gravelly and said, Hi, in a small snicker behind its voice. Whatever it was seemed to be toying with us. My girlfriend, being the pagan that she was and complete believer of the paranormal, decided that we should get a Ouija board and see if we could make contact with the other side. At first, I said no, but she was determined to do it, so she used her womanly charms to talk me into it. Big mistake. The next night, we set up the Ouija board in the living room with candles all around to light up the room. We basically conducted a seance on our coffee table. We set the planchet on the board and began asking questions. At first, there was nothing, but then my girlfriend asked for the spirit's name, and it started spelling out B-I-L-L, -L, Bill. We got a little scared. I broke the silence and asked Bill what he or she or they wanted, and I shit you not that planchette started moving around in a circular pattern on the board, and then the planchette flew off the board onto the floor. We were both freaked out for a minute, but regained our composure long enough to pick up the planchette and close the session. For those of you who are unaware, whenever a Ouija board planchette starts moving in circles, it is thought that a portal to the demonic realm opens up and causes all sorts of shit to happen to the people who are part of the session. Our buddy Bill was a malevolent entity that wanted access to us, and boy did he get it. After the session, the activity dramatically increased in the apartment. Everything began happening in threes. We would hear three loud knocks. Footsteps would come in three loud stomps. We would have noped the fuck out of there, but we were in the middle of the lease and we had to stay because we could not afford the fee for breaking the lease. A few days later, my girlfriend was out and about. I went into the kitchen and I immediately felt off. I felt nauseated and dizzy, like I was going to vomit. I regained my composure long enough to ask our good friend Bill just what he wanted. The clock on the stove flickered for a few seconds, briefly turned off, and when it came back on, I was slapped hard in the face, leaving three finger marks across my cheek. Right after this happened, my girlfriend called to say that she had been overcome by a strange feeling just a minute before and was calling to check on me. That's weird, right? I told her what happened and she came home immediately with some sage to try and cleanse the apartment. While it did work briefly, I feel like we just pissed Bill off more as the activity returned with a vengeance a few days later. The final straw was when we were sitting downstairs watching Ghost Hunters in the middle of the day on my day off. My other half said she wasn't feeling well and had gone upstairs to take a nap. I stayed downstairs to play some video games. About an hour later, I had this very weird feeling in the pit of my stomach. And then I heard footsteps running up the stairs, followed a few seconds later by a scream. I hauled ass upstairs, skipping a few at a time to get there faster. As I landed at the top of the stairs, I saw a shadow disappear into complete thin air. My girlfriend was sitting up in bed, crying in pain. She said she was asleep and then was awoken by loud steps and then a burning sensation on her side. As she lifted up her shirt, we found three puffed up, bleeding scratch uh. marks along her side. I would have left 
then, but again, we were strapped on money and could not swing breaking the lease. But as soon as the lease was up, we moved away from there. We were both relieved to be away from that apartment. We found a new place out of town that was bigger and cost just about the same. We did have a few incidents here and there, but nothing like we'd had before. My girlfriend seemed to have some sort of entity attached to her, and we believe it did follow us to our new place. But again, the activity was bearable, unlike the first apartment. Since the incidents in downtown Memphis, I have not had anything that extreme happen to me. I am now a true believer in all things that go bump in the night. I hope you were scared to death. Mm-hmm. Keep on sucking, Jared. Thanks, Jared. Mm-hmm. I've, I, I can't remember if I ever heard or not about that circular motion thing with the Ouija board. It sounds familiar. It does but, sound but familiar. But it's been a long time so I think, since that's come up. But I've, I forgot about that. That there's some kind of like, you know, things you're supposed to watch out for. Mm-hmm. While you're doing that, they can, you know, signal various things. But that, yeah. would, that would be so creepy if it just started spinning around or like flew off on uh-huh. its own. That, and that's like the story I told earlier, like two stories today of planchettes doing things on their own. Yeah. I mean, I think Ouija boards are just so terrifying because we just don't know. It, I mean, obviously, we don't know anything really about the spirit world. We're always just making guesses and yeah. You know, educated guesses, maybe even at that, you know, we're taking a body of evidence and saying like, well, this one thing happens over and over. But like, how do we decide that? How do we decide that spinning planchettes in circles on their own <laughs> right, is like right. a, a portal to a hell? A bad sign, yeah. How do we decide that mirrors on an ex- uh, exterior wall are also right. a portal? Right, this stuff, I mean superstition, but, but some superstition is grounded in more real events than others. Mm-hmm. It is also unusual. It's sort of like stereotypes. Like, why? Like, I can say this because I'm Polish. Like, Polacks and wearing socks. It's like, yeah, that comes from something. It comes from like a behavior you've seen people do over and over, Mm -hmm. right? So we now we say that as a joke or whatever. So it's like, well, then is the portal thing like, well, this happened over and over (sighs) again, and then after that, this happened. So now we surmise that this is why. Mm, I don't know. It's got to be some sort of like, yeah, history. yeah. Yeah, I wish we had those examples. We could access those examples of like, well, you know. Uh, these people while doing this, you know, know, like all had something bad happen to them. Af- and then previously the things spun around in a circular motion. Yeah. And ta-da. <laughs> now, but Ouija boards just in general, like of all the things that I've messed around with, tarot cards, crystals, uh, even like uh, working with um, pendulums and like, and Reiki and you know, things that are witchy, as you like to say, mm-hmm. of all the things, a, tar- a, a uh, Ouija board, Mm -mm. I'm out forever and ever and always. Even if you die, I'm not trying to contact you that way. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it has to do with your Catholic upbringing? Mm, No, I think it has to do with messing around with Ouija boards with my girlfriends when I was young. Yeah, yeah. And having my own set of interactions and just feeling so not good about it. Yeah. And just, and then, okay, like if you're talking about a body of evidence that you want to pull from, if you just look at three plus years of scared to death. Yeah, a lot of stories. There's never a Ouija board story that's like, and then I talked to my grandma and I felt so much better. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, mean, true, we are skewing it where we're trying to tell scarier stories. But yes, even when I'm just like looking at random stories, I never come across like, I can't, I shouldn't say never. I can't recall coming Mm -hmm. across a super happy, uplifting Ouija board story. No, and and if I do, it's like, well, at first I thought it was my mom, and then mm-hmm. this crazy, awful, terrible, this evil thing, thing came me. through. Yeah, so it's it just feels like one of the most demonic leaning tools, I guess mm-hmm. you could say. You just answered yeah. my question that I asked at the beginning of this story, which is, do you really feel the way I feel? That's how I felt, and then you said you felt that way, so you do feel the way I feel. When you asked me that previously, I said, I do feel the way you feel. Mm-hmm. I'd already answered your question. Oh, well, you just reiterated it then. Which Thank leads you. us to like couples therapy, like, you don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have time for one more story, Dan? Let me check my schedule. <laughs> yes. Perfect. <laughs> do you recall the last um, haunted house babysitting story I told you that took place with a young girl babysitting in, I want to say like New York, Hamptons. I don't remember the details, but I remember, I, tr- I truly do remember that story and remember liking it. Yeah, it was where, a great tale. Oh, 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 there was like a doppelganger situation. Like, yeah. like there was somebody on the stairs that wasn't supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, I do remember elements of that story. Yeah, that was just a, a couple of weeks ago. Great, I mm-hmm. loved that. Mm-hmm. I loved that tale. Well, as it, 
Best luck. And like, and like a phone call from somebody who didn't make the phone call. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good job. Yeah. Uh, well, as luck would have it, I have another great babysitting story for you. And Good. I think it just is like, for me, what gets me about babysitting stories is as a girl, it's just like so common. I, I don't know any boys that babysat growing up other than their siblings. Yeah. But, but it is so traditional to be like, oh yeah, you should go babysit the neighbor's kids. Like, so I think it resonates with me because I have spent so much time in other people's houses mm -hmm. that like, I don't know the creaks and the sounds of their house, but it's always a little bit creepy when it's not your house because you're like right. a little bit more on guard. Yep. Just not used to the sounds and not, not familiar with the area. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I would imagine, you know, you're, yeah, you're older, but you're still a kid. You're yeah. alone. Yeah. In this space, there's no other adults around. You're responsible for younger kids. Who are inherently creepy. A lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Like little kids are. Some well, little kids are pretty creepy. Okay. Little kids, even when they're not trying to be, say and do creepy shit. Mm -hmm. So adding to it. Well, let's dive in. I love this story so much. Of course, I had to tell it because it's in Lakewood, Ohio. And I think like what sealed the deal for me on this story is that we are going to Cleveland for Christmas this mm -hmm. year. And I was searching for an Airbnb house. And there are all these beautiful old houses in Lakewood, like old craftsmen, lots cool. of wood. And everyone I looked at, I thought, fucking no way. <sighs> no way. No, we are staying in like a modern Swedish styled brand new like condo. I'm like, nope, nope. Can't stay in any of those houses. And then I found the story and I was like, oh, turns out I was right. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Hey, Dan. Hey, Lindsay. I'm a fairly new scared to death fan, but I love it so much. I've been binging episodes like crazy and also longtime fan time of Time Suck and Dan stand up. Oh, thank you. So you're a bad magician. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, you just said yes, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I'm still freaked out from the no Stop. I heard in my ear. I'll fucking kill you. Uh, okay. My story takes place in Lakewood, Ohio around 2004. At this time, I was going to school and working part-time as a nanny for a family who had a five-year-old girl and an 18-month-old boy. Their house had all hardwood flooring and was over 100 years old. One day, while the little girl was at school and the little boy was upstairs napping, I was doing homework downstairs on the couch. From downstairs, I heard the sound of board books being thrown on the ground upstairs. I usually put a few books in the little boy's crib to help him fall asleep, and he would typically throw them out of his crib when he woke up, so I thought nothing of it. I went upstairs to get him out of bed, and when I opened the door to his room, I expected to see him jumping around in his crib, but he was fast asleep and the board books were all over the floor. I was super hmm. confused, but I just assumed I had heard incorrectly and that he had thrown them out earlier and was just and I was just happy to have more time for homework. Nothing else happened that day. Every once in a while, when I would babysit both kids at night, I would hear what I assumed was them running around upstairs, and when I would check on them, they would be asleep. Maybe they were pretending to be asleep, I would think to myself. But one night at this house, would change, but one night at this house would change what I thought of those footsteps forever. I had put both children to bed around 8 p.m. and was watching a movie alone downstairs on the couch. Around 10.30, I saw the chandelier in the dining room begin to sway, and then I heard what sounded like both children running around upstairs and into the attic, and then I heard the toilet flush several times. Feeling a bit frustrated that both kids were clearly awake and running wild upstairs, I went up to put them back to bed. To my complete shock, both children were in their beds, sleeping soundly. Then I remembered that I'd heard the toilet flushing, so I slowly looked into the bathroom and saw that the toilet handle was ripped off and dangling down. I ran downstairs so fast, trying to think of a reasonable explanation for what had just happened. Luckily, the parents came home shortly after this, and I told them what had happened. The parents looked at each other nervously. Mm. The dad took a deep breath and walked away. The mom hesitated and said, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to say anything about this because I didn't want to scare you. And then she proceeded to tell me the creepiest shit I have mm. ever heard. She told me that she hears footsteps of little kids all the time has felt taps on her shoulder, and has even heard giggling. But when she would turn around, of course, no one would ever be there. The craziest thing she told me still gives me chills to this day. One evening, she was putting her daughter to bed, and as she was reading her a bedtime story, the mom noticed that her daughter was staring into the corner of her room with a concerned look on her face. She asked her daughter what was wrong, and the little girl answered, Mommy, 
make the little girl standing in the corner go away, please. But when she turned to look at what the little girl was talking about, she saw nothing. What the actual fuck? What's even crazier is that I didn't get the fuck out. Sorry, Lindsay. I kept babysitting for this family for years after this happened. I loved the kids so much and didn't want to stop watching them just because I was scared of their house. Although I will say that after that night, we spent way more time outside at the parks and took more trips to the zoo to stay out of the house as much as possible. Luckily, nothing too scary happened to me in that house after that night. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron, you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> my my brain built a, a crazy like horror movie scenario right when the mom and the dad came home and she told told them about the toilet. Yeah. And then the dad did like the ah, sigh and like walked away. And then the mom was like, there's something I have to tell you. Yes. I pictured the mom getting very sinister then and her face twisting in a way that wasn't like normal and, and just being like, you don't get to leave now. Oh. And then like the dad like locking the door. That was not a nice voice, DJ, honey. DJ Honey. It was a little bit creepy. <laughs> DJ Dr. Jekyll. I was imagining when she, like, as I was reading the story and she was talking about the bathroom, I was like, mm. oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. She's going to open the door. There's blood in the toilet, though. Uh, no, that there was just going to be, like, little kid shadow people in the bathroom, like, messing around, like, doing things little kids do that, like, they shouldn't. Flushing the toilet over and over, turning the faucet on and off. I don't know, playing in the bathtub, like, whatever. Mm-hmm. One kid using a steak knife to take out the other kid's eyeball. Totally. And flush it. Okay, what if when they talk to the mom? If Blah, the, why did I put that own image in my head? What if when she talked to the mom and the dad like took a deep breath and walked away? What if then we would have mm -hmm. found out that all along one of those kids wasn't actually alive? That they had like oh my God. lost a child yeah. in like a horrific accident or something and that child was stuck at that age. Uh, and this whole time the babysitter had been babysitting ghost? one living child and one ghost child yeah that would be a great story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nonetheless aaron i cannot believe you went back you're brave so brave and so dumb <laughs> <laughs> but i get it like these houses man if like any of you guys if you have five minutes just go on airbnb put in lakewood ohio and you'll find like put no dollar limits yeah. so you can see the ridiculous houses there is such beautiful houses but it's you know it'll be like the houses that has like a wood um, like kind of like wood, uh, wood panel walls and like the big banisters. And then the rooms will be separated by these intricate, uh, like archways with the stained glass, like the really, really stunning houses, yeah. but every single one reads haunted every single one. Right. Yep. Yep. That style. Ah, no, thanks. Ooh, good stories today. Oh yeah. My heart's a little racy. I still feel like I could hear that person in my ear. I'm so uncomfortable. Do you, want, do you want to do your Annabelle's first? I sure do, Dan. Thank okay, you so much for asking. Let's do them. All right. I would like to thank the following Annabelle's for their support on Patreon. Wyatt Steinbach, Mallet Wicks, Sean Turner, Janelle Southard, Kate Sh uh, hmm. Hmm. Kate Shuetti. Shuetti. <laughs> That's not it, though. That can't be it. Sh Shuetti? S-C-H-U-E-T-T-E. I was looking at walking in Memphis lyrics. <laughs> I, you I are 100% busted. I'm like, what I the tried, fuck are you doing on your phone right now? I tried to be so sneaky. I was going to do it at the end. <laughs> that was like a kid in a cookie jar, a hand in a cookie jar. Oh, I knew I didn't have one of the lyrics right. <laughs> well, now I, now I can ruin it. Anyway. Dang it, I was so close. Kate walking in Memphis, sh uh, sweaty. Corey Anderson, Jordan Getz, I see you. I know. Rafael Gutierrez, Jason Busey. Pint-sized fury. I love you. Wait, That's Jason so cute. Jason Busey. Related to Gary Busey from last week? Yeah. He's okay. pissed at you. Uh, Pint-sized fury. Great one. Dylan Copeland. Ariel Hernandez. Holly Hansen. Are you like Holly Hansen from Coeur d'Alene? I know Holly Hansen here. Amber Scott. LC. That's not me. Mary S. Or maybe it's Mari S. Hunter Edwards. Jessica Smith. Caitlin Bowles. Heather McGuire. Angel Hernandez. G.E., Carlos and Anna Marie Martinez, Sadie J., Kiara and Kami, and Melly and Matthew. Thank you, Annabelle's. You're and welcome. I, and I would like to thank the following Annabelle's as well. Uh, Beth Ad the Uri family. Or maybe Beth and. And. Okay, there was no D or N there. Beth and the Uri family. Okay. Uh, Trucker Vicky Poo, Jenny Johnson, Kara Harper, Peyton Alexander. Dan is a dumb name. Feels personal. Hmm. 
Interesting. Kira Hall, Anthony Dye, uh, Illy Rihanna, Haley Kinzer, uh, Daniel Ontiveros, Bree Pendleton, Alec Roberts, Brandy Myers, Brenna, Michelle Miller Hummel. Now I'm thinking a little Hummel figurines. Oh, yeah. I'm picturing Michelle Miller Hummel being the size of a Hummel figurine. <laughs> uh, Katie Hahn, Megan Kimpo, Ben Lauren, Veronica Wine. Uh, Veronica Wine. I don't know. And now my brain went to sweet, sweet, uh, sweet berry wine. <laughs> what is, Strawberry what? wine? No, Logan, no. Logan, what? Steve Rule. <laughs> but who, Steve Rule drinks what's the kind of wine? Sweet berry wine. It is sweet berry wine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sweet berry wine. <laughs> uh, Veronica Wine. Yeah. Antoinette Shrewsbury, Sonny Beecher, Jay Bash, Anthony Wall. And Lawler Skate. <laughs> like it. Then you get some spooky shout outs. You're in a pretty funny mood today. I don't know. I feel a little squirrely. <laughs> I can tell. You know what I'm feeling like? <laughs> like you're walking in Memphis? Like, like you're walking, walking your... with my feet 10 feet off of Beale. That's what I wanted to get. 10 feet off of what? Beale. Like Beale Street? Yeah. And I was saying, I had my whole life uh, 10 feet off the ground. Yeah, I, me I, too. But I knew that wasn't right. I thought it was Fields. Wait well, according, according to according to Google's lyrics generator, it's uh, Beale, B E A L E. Does every verse at n at no point does he say with my feet ten feet off the ground? Because um, sometimes it changes like mm, the second or third or fourth time through. In this lyrics, it's I don't all believe Beale. it. It's I don't believe Beale. it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Okay. Oh my god, is that like Mandela effect where we all think it we was ten thought. feet off the ground? Put on my blue face. Do you want to um, do a spooky shout outs? <laughs> We're going to get so many emails about how people hate you right now. <laughs> Guys, just know that like if I was doing this alone, those moments would never happen. <laughs> You'd have to listen to me say words incorrectly and maybe talk too much, but you would never have to deal with that. <laughs> uh, yes, I do have some okay. awesome spooky shout outs to Decooter from <clears> your <throat> emotional support human. Happy 30th birthday to Kenner from Pammy. Thanks for 40 years of love, laughs, and creepy shows. 40 years. 40 years. Are we going to make it that long? I hope so. How old are you right now? Like 102? Whoa. <laughs> 31. <laughs> 45. Okay, we could we could probably get 40 more years. 40 years total. That'd be 30 more. I could probably pull that off. You think you could pull mm, off like 80-ish? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> to Andrew from Teresa, happy birthday to my favorite creep. And to Oliver, the dad, from Oliver, the son, thanks for showing me this awesome podcast. Oh, that's so nice. I know, so cute. You know what they say? Families that spoop together stay together. Oh, all right. That should be like on a shirt. Like, spook. Do you remember I, I, when I, I, those I, I, billboards I, I, were all over LA? They were so stupid. It was like families that blah together yeah. stay together. I did for a while do couples that suck together stay together. <laughs> well, I bet they do. <laughs> um, that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death podcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scared to death podcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith and Tyler C for their work on social media and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to Logan for producing and directing today. today. Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And to book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing the listener stories for book number four. Thanks to producer Sarah Finch over across the pond for finding the first story I told this week. And Sophie Evans for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content and see the pictures that accompany each episode at Scared to Death Podcast. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, with well over 20,000 horror loving members. You can follow us on TikTok as well. Also at Scared to Death Podcast to check out special moments, highlights, great way to get some visuals if you just listen normally. If you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon, get the entire catalog ad-free and so much more. Uh, special thanks to singer-songwriter Mark Kahn for coming up with uh, Walking to Memphis and adding so much value to our show today. Uh, I was waiting for you to say, and if on Patreon, if you would like to pay a million dollars, you can meet me, Michael McDonald. And then you, you were going to like bust into a song. You touch down in the middle of... <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't having nightmares before, now you will. In the middle of the pouring rain. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. I hope you were scared to death. With my friend, yeah, Send help. <laughs> if spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace.
let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but hath no home here within, scared to death. Yes, Michael, I do. Okay. All right.